Uh, I am going to talk about my feelings on Tears of the Kingdom. It will be full spoilers. If you do not want spoilers, uh, then you should leave right now. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, because I'm going to talk. I don't have, like, video examples to throw up here or anything. Uh, but I spent, like, 150 hours playing it, so I might as well get my, 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 my bad media takes on. I never played Breath of the Wild. At the time I it, at, at the time it came out, I didn't have a Switch. I didn't have any money because uh, it was before I started my stream, and I saw everyone loved it. And I watched a ton of playthroughs, analysis videos. I mean, I, I I never played Breath of the Wild, but I feel like I played Breath of the Wild. I have memories of Breath of the Wild that are substantial enough that it makes me feel like in my memory, like oh yeah, this thing, you know. Of course, that's not the same as fully playing a game, so, you know, you can take from that what you will. But, um, I have played Tears of the Kingdom. I'm really glad that I didn't play Breath of the Wild, because Tears of the Kingdom is the same game. It is an expansion pack. Um, anyone who says otherwise is coping. So I'm gonna talk about this. People say I have bad media takes, but, like, let's, 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 let's really break this down. Let's get into this, okay? I really enjoyed Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it. It's a deeply, deeply flawed game that I enjoyed a lot. And I'm so glad that I waited to, and didn't play Breath of the Wild beforehand, because I feel like that would have really, like, soured me on Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, I got 100% of Shrines. I uh, completed the full game, of course. I got about 350 Korok Seeds. I, I did a lot of content in the three or so weeks that I was just nonstop playing Tears of the Kingdom. And the more I played it, the more I began to resent the game. And this is partially my fault and also partially the game's fault. So let me, yeah, okay, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit, let's talk a little bit about, like, what the game is. The original Zelda games were, well, I mean, the original, original Zelda games, going back to, like, the NES and stuff, were very different from what we play today. But the games that I grew up on playing in Zelda were uh, Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, and I really liked them. They're kind of like puzzle games, mostly. The real difficulty of those games, the things that you get stuck on, are usually the puzzles, in my experience. The games aren't really meant to be that difficult. They're mostly meant to engage you and pull you along through a succession of interesting locations and caves and secrets and uh, dungeons. And I think they always succeeded at doing that. Majora's Mask was really experimental, and it did things very differently. But the fundamental core experience of playing Majora's Mask was pretty similar to playing Ocarina of Time. Very different games, but the core experience is what's preserved. When I talk about core experience, what I'm referring to is the fundamental nature of the relationship between you and the game that you're playing, right? So games that are very different can have the same fundamental gameplay experience, you know? Many shooters, for example, hit on the same beats. But on the other side, there are games with nearly identical mechanics that have, like, totally different game feels. A good example of this would be, like, the mechanics between traditional, like, boomer shooters and modern first-person shooters, like military stuff, you know? Even though the fundamentals of the gameplay are almost identical in how they function, uh, the experience of playing them is massively different due to the context, um, the graphics, the way the world and levels are designed, the way the enemies behave, the way you're expected to overcome them. But it's still fundamentally a shooter, right? The modern Zelda games, uh, Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, are so different from previous Zelda games that I feel like they shouldn't even be called the same thing. Uh, like, there's... In Tears of the Kingdom, there is nothing of Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask. The things that made me like those old games are not here. Instead, the things that I like about Tears of the Kingdom are entirely new. They're separate things that are doing their own thing. If you go into Tears of the Kingdom or Breath of the Wild looking for some kind of nuanced or intricate dungeon environment to overcome, you're an idiot or a fool, and you're going to get bamboozled. The most that this game has for dungeons or like intricate puzzle work or puzzle clockwork, you know, environments to overcome with, uh, you know, like it, it try to outmaneuver and master the environment. It, it, there are like gameplay platforming gauntlets, and that's about the most it gets. You know, it's an entirely new thing. I think the thing that people like about Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild, because they are the same game fundamentally, are like the feeling of being able to explore the world and like do or see anything. 
And the main problem with Tears of the Kingdom is that it's terrible at this because every part of Tears of the Kingdom is the same. You can never be surprised by anything that you experience in this game because everything is standardized and homogenized in a way that every player will very quickly recognize and then not be shocked by again. The first time you go up to the, the Sky Islands past the tutorial, you know what Sky Islands are because all Sky Islands are the same Sky Islands. In fact, many of them are literally copy-pasted around the sky. They're big, uh, uh, you know, floating chunks of rock uh, that will have um, the Zonai-like gotcha game dispense devices, uh, a couple of shrines, their structure and format are virtually identical to each other. Uh, past a point when you go up to the Sky Islands, you're doing it for like uh, completionist or, 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 or busy work, you know, reasons. It's not something novel. It fails to sh surprise or shock you. Uh, likewise with exploring the overworld where it's just uh, a, literally just a large, just really, really large green expanse where bokoblins are running around. <laughs> I don't know. Um, does anyone... Does anyone genuinely enjoy the feeling of exploration in these games? Like, here's the thing. Dark Souls is a game about exploration, and Dark Souls constantly made me feel like, whoa, I've stepped behind a painting, and I'm experiencing something new now. Everything in Dark Souls, I'm talking about the original, not like the, the, the games broadly, Every new environment you encounter elicited in me this feeling of wonder because there was something so new and innovative and unique about it. And then in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, it's like, well, no. You always know what you're going to see. The underground, the overworld, and the sky islands are all the same. You traverse the environment and you see more of them. And sometimes the electric keys will be replaced with cold keys. But you can't really find anything that surprises you because if there's a hole in the ground, it's a cave. And you know what caves are because you've been to 57 caves before. There will be a white frog dude in there. If it's a well, then you know what wells are and what they're like. It gets ticked off the map. This, this pattern of open world design where everything is homogenized in a completionist sense reminds me so much of the way Ubisoft uh, makes their games it makes me it's they, they've done this in diablo 4 as well where it used to be in diablo 2 and 3 even with some randomization environments had like a distinct feel to them as you moved between them they were all specifically named i remember them there was like the Bloodmore and the highland the arathi highlands and blah blah i remember in diablo 2 like every area would be like oh this area even though it's specific design is randomized a bit is distinct enough that I feel like it has an identity. Has anyone played any of Diablo 4? That's gone. Now it's just a gigantic open world with a bunch of paths that are all just the same. You just move through them. This area is cold and this area is warm. Doesn't make much of a difference except visually. I feel like the new trend in making open world games is to build a colossal map now that consoles and computers are capable of handling it. And then they make the map and they turn to the game designers and they're like, okay, now what can you speckle across the map in an even fashion? So people can open up their menu, see three X's completed out of 147 and want to keep playing the game. And then they just do that. It doesn't feel like anything's custom made or crafted specifically. Even unique experiences in a specific environment have to eventually be repeated. We saw this problem with Elden Ring too, right? Elden Ring had a bespoke open world with areas and environments that were distinct, even within large environments like the largely uninteresting uh, snowfields, had corners to them that were distinct and memorable. The area around the teleporter to uh, Moog's uh, uh, underground palace had like the blood petals all around it, and there was that river that cut through it. I remember it distinctly, despite not even liking the area that much or, or even at all. Um, but even Elden Ring ran into these issues, right? Because like, the first time you beat one of those dog-faced stone sentinels, it's like, oh, that was cool. The 17th time, no. The first time you defeat one of those big, like, undulating, polluted worm things, 
Like, that's fun. It's very fun. Even the second or third time. But the 20th time? No. The dragons. Dragons everywhere. Now, one thing that is to Elden Ring's benefit is that it doesn't have any inbuilt completionist mechanics. What I mean by that is that you never open up the menu in Elden Ring and get confronted with a thing telling you that you haven't gotten enough of, or you've only gotten so many of, some collectible. In Elden Ring, exploration is purely for fun. It's purely for enjoyment. The game doesn't push you to do it. In fact, the graces of gold will direct you towards the next story-specific area you have to go to. Hell, there's not even anything in the game that compels you to collect all of the remembrances or parts of the Elden Ring. You don't, you're not even told to get all the runes. Most players will, but you can beat the game without having defeated uh, Radon or without defeating Godric. You can just do that. The problem that I have with Tears of the Kingdom, the thing that really gets me, is that I have completionist brain rot. I, I really like completing games. I really enjoy it. All achievements, if I can, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, oftentimes I'll find myself doing this completionist thing beyond the point that I'm actually enjoying the game. I get kind of resentful if a game has a lot of stuff to collect, and I like it enough to be interested to keep playing, but it starts, the tedium starts to wear on. Tears of the Kingdom is a deeply tedious game if you have a completionist mindset. Now, I'm of the opinion that when you're a game designer, you are largely responsible for the way players engage with your systems to the extent that you kind of direct them towards it. So, for example, if somebody has a bad time with Elden Ring because they feel a compulsion to collect every item in the game, every armor in the game, every spell in the game, every talisman in the game, and so on, like I did over the course of 500 hours, I don't hold that against from software. Nothing in the game compelled me to do that besides my own brain damage. However, in Breath of the Wild, your loading screen shows you your collectibles, your Korok seeds, the shrines you've completed, the spirit orbs you're carrying, the map opens up, and when you have completed a significant portion of it, it is speckled with markers that beg your attention. Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild are built to encourage those mechanics, which is why I resent these games for being boring. <laughs> See, that's the issue. I really liked exploration in Tears of the Kingdom. For a while, I liked it when I moved along main paths, encountered new areas. I liked entering, I especially liked um, the Goron area, uh, uh, Death Mountain. I liked traveling up it slowly and seeing the corruption get worse and worse. I, I liked that a lot. Um, the problem, of course, is that if you want to do the completionist stuff, you're uh, kind of pushed into a very unfun gameplay style. It's easy to get all the shrines because you can easily get all of the light roots in, the, um, in, in the, uh, the underground, in the depths, and that tells you where the shrines are on top. Uh, so that's easy. That's not too bad. If you want to get all of the caves, though, you need to alternate in between uh, giving fruit to the little mountain spirits so that it'll light up all the cavern areas and going there and physically going in and seeing. Now, the issue with this is that... Um, even caverns that you've already explored and completed by slaying the little frogman inside will light up. Meaning that if you really want to fully complete um, the, uh, you know, all the, all the, 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 the little frog dudes, you know, you kind of have to do this like switching back and forth between the map to triangulate where exactly you need to be facing to get the proper dungeon or like which one you have or have not been in before. Uh, which, which is very frustrating. I don't like the way Korok seeds work either. I know you're not supposed to collect all the Korok seeds, but I mean, they just get boring to do. There's a reason people make jokes about the, um, like the little Korok dudes that ask you to take them to your friend or to their friend because they're not fun to do, right? And what, what I'm kind of like really meandering my way over towards right now 
is that for a game that is largely about exploring a grand open world and experiencing all it has to offer, it has nowhere near enough to offer. And I don't think that's just like a completionist brain rot position. I think that's just true. Most caverns aren't interesting. They're, you know, you go into one. There are like a hundred of these, okay? You go into one. Sometimes entrances will be blocked by um, rocks, you know? Uh, and then you shoot them and that's the puzzle. Congratulations. Uh, if you don't have the Goron dude yet or bomb arrows, then you just like take a claymore, fuse it to a rock and spend five minutes smacking away at it. Uh, fun. Very fun. Uh, they'll have the frog dude in them. They're not really interesting. They're certainly not little miniature dungeons. They're just uh, uh, kind of busy work. I mean, a lot of it's busy work, right? Even the combat, honestly, is, is pretty uninteresting um, because it, it plays the same all the time. You see people doing like creative, wacky physics puzzle stuff in the combat on Reddit and Twitter, and that's fun. It's pretty cool what you can do with that. But that's not how people actually play the game, um, right? Like you all understand that and agree. Like, you can do sick bomb shield flip jump crazy wacky combos, but that's you, you don't. If you did that, you would spend like five hours on setup for every encampment. In reality, the way you play an encampment usually plays out basically the same, which kind of brings us up against the real problem with Tears of the Kingdom and the reason why it gets kind of tedious. It's that you have too much freedom. See, the problem with freedom is that gameplay limitations are usually what define the um uh, you know the 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 experience of engaging with it a good example would be like a like a platformer like Celeste for example or Super Meat Boy would Celeste be a better more interesting game if you had infinite dashes and could just sort of like dash fly your way through every challenge without engaging with any of the level mechanics obviously not the whole point is the difficulty of working with the limitations but in Tears of the Kingdom, you, the player, can do anything. And total freedom sounds great, especially with the uh, fuse mechanic. Or not fuse, sorry, the ultra hand mechanic, which is a lot of fun, you know, when, you, when you're still figuring it out. But you've noticed, haven't you, the discourse online. Uh, I've seen people say that they actually have to, like, keep themselves from using some of the vehicle combinations because they make things too easy. For example, you get a little drone bot, like a thing that moves on the ground, plus a head on top that turns to face enemies, and then a frost uh, projector. Nine Zonai to construct with the auto build trivializes every single camp in the game that is not a boss. Uh, you just set it down and it will just run around and freeze everything and you just get to run around smacking stuff uh, there is no longer any challenge to fighting any non-bosses. And the bosses aren't hard. At all. So, that's gone. All vertical engagement, all mastery of the climbing mechanics of the parkour, well, as soon as you realize that you can overcome 99.9% .9 of vertical challenges with rocket fusing to a shield or just creating a hot air balloon with the auto build, that's the most efficient way of playing. Uh, there are so many things that they can't do in Tears of the Kingdom because the player has been given the tools to effortlessly overcome it. None of the dungeons in Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask could have functioned if you had the ability to climb up everything, do anything, fuse a vehicle, do whatever. It wouldn't work, right? Because obviously the limitations are what you're working around. And after a very short time, I just stopped finding the freedom uh, enjoyable. Um, it stopped being interesting to me. Basically, every enemy can be defeated effortlessly with that little vehicle that I suggested. You can also just headshot them with an arrow. It's not hard to do. And then just hit them a bunch, then headshot with an arrow. It's tedious, but it's also the most efficient path. And the problem here is, again, total freedom isn't just aimless. Gameplay design still directs the paths that players are going to go down. And if the most efficient way of playing a game is tedious and unengaging and you have to limit yourself and play suboptimally in order to have fun, I consider that a flaw in the gameplay. It's kind of like those games where your dodge doesn't have a cooldown and dodging is faster than moving, so it's actually faster to dodge constantly like a goofball instead of like doing a run 
You've ever ever played a game like that or like a forward roll or something? Yeah, that um, that's always kind of annoying, right? Because it's like, oh, I have like this walk I need to do that's like a minute and a half. Uh, as I guess I better like do this because like otherwise, like that it's annoying. It's not a huge deal, but it's annoying. Likewise, I don't think it's a huge deal that a bunch of combat encounters can be trivialized quite easily with minimal investment in a way that basically, you know, removes most of the gameplay mechanics. But it's a bit of a bother. It doesn't help that the combat itself is painfully simple. There are basically only three weapon types. There are minor exceptions like the boomerang, but for the most part, you have small stick, big stick, spear, and you'll just be playing with that. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty strange, I think, that in a game that's all about like freedom and you can make your own vehicles, that actually dealing damage to an enemy with the melee weapons that you, Link, the swordsman, have is by far the most underbaked and underdeveloped part of the game. They give you so much in the other, you know, in, in, in the other uh, systems, but for this, you were just emaciated. You can parry, but guys, do you have to parry? No, nothing demands you parry. You can just flurry rush everything. And the flurry rush is way too powerful. I mean, you know, leaving aside the apparent inaccuracy of flurry rushes, uh, that is to say, sometimes they don't go off when they should and do go off when they shouldn't. Uh, they're way too strong. You know, like they do an immense amount of damage essentially for free. I think I think it was kind of funny that the, the developers preempting this in the final fight with Ganondorf, uh, you know, he has his own flurry rush mechanic and you have to do two perfectly timed dodges instead of uh, just one. I thought that was kind of cute because he flurry rushes you basically. It's a shame that the Ganondorf fight uh, can be effortlessly overcome with the, uh, you know, time-honored strategy of uh, hit him in the head with a bow. Seriously, one Lionel bow, uh, draw it, fuse those little uh, rib cages that you get basically for free when you're doing your questing in the, um, the Lightning Temple, uh, and you can defeat the final boss in basically no time. Basically no time. Just with, you j jump up in the air and then snipe shoot him 17 times floating down with the arrow time. You know, with the, the bullet time you get. Pretty dumb, I think. Is this a fair criticism? The game gives you incredible freedom to engage with the systems and as a consequence of that, the best way to use those systems is boring and annoying and samey. That past a point, like every Sky Island that I wanted to get to, could have either been some kind of arduous trek to find the specific path on the ground that would get me to the place I needed to go, or I could just create a balloon, wait a minute going up, and then be there. See, stuff like this really bothers me, because I like what limitations can do for a game. And, man, when you're going for 100% completion, you're not playing to experience anything new at that point, the way some games can still offer in 100% completion. To go back to another game that I 100% completed, Celeste. Celeste is a platformer. To get 100% completion, you have to get all the golden strawberries, regular strawberries, the B-sides, the C-sides. It's a whole, it's a big game. Uh, but um, every bit of content that you do in Celeste to get that 100% is bespoke. It's uniquely created. Celeste doesn't have like 17 identical chambers that you overcome with the same jump and you just have to do that, right? Like every new thing you find is new and it's rewarding. Yeah. I tell you, there were times that I was playing Breath of the Wild um, and I was having a lot of fun, but eventually I just got that Skyrim problem. It's a big wide world, but it's puddle deep, you know? It's not an ocean. The wind temple getting up there was fun, right? You you start with this big cyclone and then you 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 go up and do all the platforms, then you bounce on top of these ancient ships, and then you go on top of the big ship. But do you know in a mechanical sense what I was actually doing? Because like, think about it for a second. Approaching the wind temple, that's what I'm describing, the wind temple, required no mechanical effort on my part. Um I mean, it, it you would have to be, I think, a simpleton to struggle with navigating the platforms and bounces up. You have a paraglider you can just float indefinitely on, more or less. And then once you actually make it to the Wind Temple, um, your objectives are immediately marked in the map, 
And I think you would have to be a bit of a simpleton, respectfully, to not just immediately understand what you need to do. There's no like real puzzle or mystery. You never see something and go, oh, I wonder how I'll overcome that later. It's, there are five wind locks. You are accompanied by the boy who creates wind. Go get them. They're very easy to get. And then you have a boss. And I don't think I've like ever taken damage to that boss. He's this big flat butt plug in the sky. And you just, you can just dive through or shoot the three centers of the beads. I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's even possible to die to him, to be honest. Like, seriously. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, really simple fight. I think the boss that offended me the most by far though, is the one under death mountain, because I genuinely like, I genuinely don't know if I'm doing it wrong or if I like discovered a secret to defeat the boss effortlessly. But if, if you're, if you have your Goron companion, just use his ability on cooldown and the boss will never hit you ever. Literally like Hit two of his legs, he falls down, you beat him up, he gets back up. By the time he's back up, you're able to hit one of his legs again. Then hit the second one. And then he's down again. Yeah, I, I don't know. Comparing this to another, you know, modern reinterpretation of uh, an old Nintendo classic, you know, the later bits of Super Mario Odyssey did have genuinely challenging content, didn't they? I think for the most part, it was kind of panderingly easy. And again, Super Mario Odyssey does that thing where they just make a big like map and they just speckle it with bullshit to do that doesn't challenge you. It's just like, oh, here's just shit to do. Like this part of the map has this shit to do and this part of the map has this shit to do and this part of the map has this shit. Like it's not cohesive or, or, or structured in a way that kind of leads you up a natural incline of difficulty and challenge the way it should. They just put shit in the map but later on in Super Mario Odyssey, there were tough, uh, uh, you know, moons to get for sure. Not enough of them, but some. What is difficult to do in Tears of the Kingdom? I'm actually asking. Like, what's the gameplay? You know? If you take damage in a fight, you have infinite health that you can pause for in your inventory. Mechanically, the game is pretty easy just to begin with. It kind of hands you everything you need and more. Um, the Lionel fights? The Lionel fi uh, Silver Lionels are pretty tough. But they're not really interesting, right? They have like three or four mechanics, basically all of which can be resolved with backflip. Didn't find them that interesting. I mostly found them um, punishing. In the sense that if I made a mistake with my dodge timing, I would just lose all of my health in a single strike. But that doesn't strike me as a particularly interesting way of managing difficulty. Especially since the way the armor and damage systems work in that game, Joseph Anderson's video talks about this in Breath of the Wild, leaves you, at most points in the game, in a position where most of the enemies that you encounter will deal no damage to you. And then every once in a while, a silver enemy will eat two-thirds of your health with a single strike. Which, you know, okay. Um, that's definitely a way of handling things. Even the challenges the game offers you that are meant to be unique are taken away by the leniency of other systems that it creates. So when I first went down to the depths, I thought, oh, this is really cool. The depths is going to be like an end game area that I can only get little peeks at right now as a low level link. Um, the, uh, 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 you know, uh, because the gloom, like it'll take your hearts away and, uh, you know, you, you, it'll be like limited how far you can progress. All these enemies, all the gloom on the ground, like this is going to be the tough challenge. This is how they're going to give you a real challenge, even though you can just open up your inventory and eat a bunch of food whenever you want. And then it turns out that you can cure the gloom hearts uh, with one of the most easy to find plants on the Sky Islands. You will have dozens of them effortlessly. The challenge of the depths instantly negated with no effort. I don't know why they even put it there. The moment you realize this, the mechanic basically doesn't even exist anymore. Like, seriously, it, it just goes away. 
Because now it's just you have two of those in your inventory, and whenever your gloom gets too high, you just eat the meal. And and is that fun? If the challenge is making sure you have the right food to be prepared, that doesn't strike me as particularly interesting. It's not like Monster Hunter World or whatever, where the preparations involve like knowing exactly what you're going to be fighting and kind of working around that. It's more um, just you've infin you've infinite space. You can just hold it in your inventory forever, and if you run out because you use them, you just make more, and that's it. It's it's busy work. A lot of the game is busy work. Making food is busy work. It takes so long. It's annoying. It's really annoying to be like okay on health and then to have to like go into a food crisis because you got in a fight with two silver enemies at once and the game instantly goes from like you know you can kind of like meander around and have fun fighting enemies to oh no actually i have to headshot them in between every strike because it takes me like a minute to do the whole cooking thing if they hit me because i have to heal myself for it also there's no point to most of the cooking most of the cooking is just role-playing bullshit if you want a full heal, you just cook a single hearty ingredient and like an apple or something. There's no point to like 98% of the recipes at all. I know that a lot of it is just like role playing stuff or having like the variety of different options to make effectively the same kind of meal, but then they just make a type of meal that does the health thing. Like, did I hate Tears of the Kingdom? I think I hated Tears of the Kingdom. I think it's actually really tedious. I think, I feel like Tears of the Kingdom is like a little spinning key, like, but it's a bunch of keys you jangle in front of somebody. I, I, I feel, I feel like the keys, you jangle the keys and it's like, oh, look at the keys. I will, okay, I'm sorry. I'm being a little bit unfair. I will be clear. I will be clear. Um, the game is beautiful. There is something genuinely exhilarating about being able to climb a mountain and look around you and know for an absolute, undeniable, certifiable fact that everything there is yours to explore should you choose to. That feels really, really good. The parts of the game that corresponded to uh, the main storyline I found enjoyable. It was never challenging. I could beat all of the content effortlessly in a way that I found patronizing and genuinely unengaging. But the experience of it was still fun. Um, the dialogue and writing was ear grating and unimaginably painful. Uh, I maybe should have switched to the Japanese audio, like Kanye suggested I do. But like, yeah, uh, I don't, I don't understand the voice direction. I don't understand the writing. I don't understand a lot of things. I don't understand why there's so much wasted time in the game. Every time you do anything or interact with any system or NPC, the game makes you fucking wait. You want to auto build or fuse something, you better wait for all like the fuses to line up and correct. You want to do anything with the horse, better make sure you have to talk for five hours to the stable master who has four lines of dialogue to share with you after you're done doing the thing you specifically said in the menu you wanted to do. And if you want to go in and do like an in thing, then you have to watch him slowly walk back to the other side of the interior so that he can talk to you. Uh, y you know, you meet idiot who's trying to hold up all the Hudson signs that's a process every time you know the, the cooking no we can't have a cooking menu that's not that's not realistic enough oh and the horses man dude why even Elden Ring lets you summon your horse like magically even the Witcher 3 which is a very realistic game in terms of its tone and atmosphere has Roach appear to you when you call for her why, in all games, is this cartoon world the one where in order for you to have your horse, you have to literally bring it with you, no matter how inconvenient, and the process of, like, keeping your horse around, and, like, if you call to them and they're nearby, they have to, like, slowly make their way over, and your horse can't do shit? Like, you can fly in these games, and for some reason, your horse will get uppity with you if you ask it to jump over a small rock? I swear to God, Epona from Nintendo 64 games were was was less, like, fucking, uh, demanding when it came to the quality of the terrain that she had to go over. 
Like, it, it, I, the horse is just obsolete. It, it's frankly upsetting that the, the the horse is in such a bad design state. The game wastes so much of your time. There's so much repetitive bullshit. All of the mechanics are easily overcome. The most efficient way to do stuff is never the most interesting. Uh, the freedom is cool when you're just playing in Gmod with vehicles, but you'll very quickly settle on that one hover bike that everyone goes to. Um, the goat slut... King Raru was very hot, and I thought he was attractive. Um, oh, and I thought the story was really, really beautiful. Um, I thought that uh, I thought that it was really cool and fitting, considering the fact that in Breath of the Wild, Zelda does this like ambiguous century of conflict with Ganon while waiting for you, the chosen hero, to return. The sacrifice made by Zelda in uh, Tears of the Kingdom, I found genuinely touching and was a very strong narrative moment that I really, really cared for. For those of you who, uh, I warned you all about spoilers, for those of you who haven't played and are just curious what it was, um, basically, uh, a million billion years ago, Ganondorf shows up, and he's a big dick, and he's evil, and he's very strong, and, uh, he, um, very nearly conquers the kingdom of Hyrule and brings the world to an end, blah de blah. Uh, but he stopped um, through sacrifice, and one million years later, you and Zelda happen upon his mummified corpse, which reanimates, and he immediately fucking owns both of you. Uh, in the nanosecond after he owns both of you, Zelda time warps back to a bajillion years ago, um, and is then present in the events that lead up to Ganondorf first rising. So you are in a post Ganondorf emerging the second time over world and Zelda is a billion years in the past and you find out by um, uh, uh, studying these geoglyphs uh, what she was doing in the past you try to uncover like what she had done back then like where is she you know where, where is Zelda she's in the past but she can move through time so where is she now right it turns out uh, that in your initial opening encounter with Ganondorf the master sword is destroyed you take it uh, uh, through time to Zelda, you send it back in time, and Zelda is told that the only way for the Master Sword to regain strength is for it to be kept in contact with a being of light, basically. And Zelda is a being of light. So basically what she does is she um, uh, sacrifices her sanity to become an immortal dragon to live as an unthinking, like nearly unfeeling beast for millennia, while keeping the Master Sword embedded in her head so that she can, in real time, reunite with Link in the present. Uh, she, she basically like commits herself to brain jail for a literal eon. It's uh, actually pretty badass and handled pretty cool. She helps you defeat Ganondorf at the end, and, um, and I, thought it was, uh, I thought it was done really well. It's a really good way of keeping her role in the story uh, as kind of like a damsel in the sense that she's not an active participant in the plot, while also making her cooler than everyone else, including Link, probably. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, like the sacrifice done there is 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 significant. And then you you fight um, Ganondorf at the end with her. And um, I also really like the design of. Um, of Zelda as a dragon because she's horrifying. It's really, really cool. They really committed to like the existential horror, I think, of her like sacrificing her sanity to become this ethereal being because she looks like bugged out. She look at her. She looks so bugged out. She's flying around the overworld for the entire game, you know, when you when you finally realize what she is, you can uh, take the master sword from her. And then of course you save her in the end. Got them Godwin eyes? Yeah, literally. I took it before knowing. Nice. What am I talking about? This was the least structured instead of... I feel like this was just me ranting, if anything. Okay, yeah, so uh, uh, basically it's, uh, it's a terrible game. Um, 
follow the main story content and fuck around at your at your leisure, but do not make an effort at pulling back the rock and seeing what lies beneath because nothing does. Um, once you've seen the depths, you've seen the depths. Uh, you know, once you've seen a biome, like once you've gone to one of the four corners of the world and gone there and kind of gotten a feel for it, uh, you've seen it. You know, you you will only see uh, iterations and what you have already seen with incredibly minor, if possibly no changes. Um, you know, it, that's not that engaging. I think that there are about 30 to 40 hours of good gameplay in, um, in, in Tears of the Kingdom and that the rest of it is just like, a fly trap that idiots like me fall into. You know what I mean? And I think that's meaningful, by the way. I, I, I really, really do. Because when something isn't mechanically interesting to engage with, the fun of engaging with it is novelty. It's experiential, right? But when it's copied over and over, there's no longer any novelty. The experience remains the same. So it's not, it wouldn't be like, for, for, uh, like it's not like, say, Dark Souls, which does have engaging combat, if Dark Souls had an area where there's like, you know, a kind of like a smattering of similar stuff, I wouldn't mind it as much. Even in Elden Ring, where I criticized Elden Ring for having uh, copy-paste bosses way too many times, even with the dragons, it's still fighting a dragon. I still found it mechanically satisfying to fight the dragons, to fight the statue guardians, to fight the this, to fight the that, because, well, it's Elden Ring, right? Elden Ring has a really good combat system. Um, Breath of the Wild doesn't. Or sorry, Tears of the Kingdom. But it's the same game. So, you know, you can trivialize everything so easily. It's not really challenging. At most, the fights devolve into a kind of keep away where you move away from it and then fire arrows to uh, pick off targets. It asks very little of you. You're always faster and more capable than the things you fight. Uh, the bosses are effortlessly beatable. The environments are samey. The quests, the side quests are uninteresting in both a writing and mechanical perspective. I didn't find any of them engaging. Just follow the main story stuff. Man, that's the thing. That's the thing. Listen, can I just end on this, okay? I want to show you something. I'm going to show you the map for Diablo 4, okay? I've only played a little bit of Diablo 4, and I'm not going to play more for a while for a variety of reasons, okay? You know what this map feels like to explore? Let's go through one little area. Right here. Say you're over here. See, the map is speckled with a bunch of collectibles. There are dungeons, there are statues to Lilith. So what do you want to do if you want to find those statues and dungeons, which give you very important bonuses? You start right here in the top left corner, and you plan your route. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Now, there's nothing interesting, unique, bespoke, or custom created about this. It's a big, flat, bespeckled chunk of land that you just have enemies constantly appearing over, going around and do do do. But there's no experience. When I say experience, what I mean is a memory. No one will remember this area. Or, hey, most of them. They all look kind of the same, don't they? See how they carve the same winding paths? All feels basically the same. I remember the dungeons in Ocarina of Time. And the reason I remember is because they weren't just custom created, right? They offered me something experientially distinctive in a way that uh, this open world can't. Or, you know what? Here, Tears of the Kingdom completed map. Now again, there is a lot of really cool stuff to see in Tears of the Kingdom. I do not want to imply otherwise. Um, there's also, it's just overwhelmed by the same cool stuff, which will be, be repeated endlessly over and over and over again, you know? And, and, you know, it's, what's fun the first time is not, not necessarily fun over and over again. It's really difficult to, um, to understand just how large the Tears of the Kingdom map is, unless you've actually played the game, but we're looking at a 
we're looking at a lot of stuff. This also isn't all the completion icons. There's all sorts of crap over here. You can see all the entrances to dungeons, the depths. This one doesn't even have the dungeon entrances on it. Or the wells. This only has a fraction of the total content that you can see. See, it's all beautiful from a distance. And fuck, it is beautiful. But is it as beautiful if I told you that this platform right here, this Sky Island, has a Korok seed you get for diving into a bunch of lily pads arranged in a circle? It's impossible to miss once you get there. And there are many Korok seeds you get that way. That's all there is here. There's nothing on this one. Nothing on this one. They're just placed there. I think that open worlds need to have a purpose to them. There needs to be something um, structurally guided about them. They have to be in service of something meaningful. And, and Tears of the Kingdom certainly are, because Tears of the Kingdom is all about the big freedom of running around and being able to dive from the sky all the way to the depths. And, woo, and that is great. But, you know. I genuinely feel like my memories of Tears of the Kingdom would be so much better if there was one fourth of the content. One fourth of the shrines, one fourth of the dungeons, one fourth of the Korok seeds, of everything. And that a lot of the open world was kind of like how it is in um, Shadow of the Colossus. Just a big open expanse to give you a feeling as you move to the next piece of real content. But what is real content in Tears of the Kingdom? It can't just be the four dungeons because they're so pithy and insubstantial. Does it include the shrines? Well, if that's the case, then all 120 of them are on the map being begging you to complete them all. That's a lot. That's, that's a lot of content to do. I don't know. Hopefully my feelings here have been made. I, I, I want to be clear, by the way. Uh, you're not bad if you enjoyed Tears of the Kingdom at all. I'm just... This has all been so rambly. The, the point that I'm trying to get across on a fundamental level is that freedom can be crippling past a point. Um, if it's freedom to be, a, to be sort of thrown into a swamp of samey content that uh, it doesn't innovate or differentiate itself, then... I don't know. And if it's freedom that allows you to break the fighting mechanics in a way that turns every fight into like an uninteresting slog unless you deliberately withhold from doing so, I don't think that's great, personally. I think that creativity should be in service of the game. I think that it should feel good to play the game in an effective fashion.